the help of AI, I can upgrade my skill set faster than anyone else. So one of the biggest things I learned was that instead of judging myself and pushing me to like, I need to have the right answer right now in this moment. So I would say the number one skill to learn, I know later on you will ask that, is actually prompt engineering. But the eng I like to drop the engineering part because I don't code. So I don't actually use Python to do like all this prompt engineering, but I use human language. But that's a whole skill there to like, how do you write a really good prompt? If you give me a prompt, I can guarantee you that I can 10x the quality of the output if you just write better. So Welcome to Untrapping Product Teams. Today is a special episode. I'm delighted to have Shivi Shi with us. She's a LinkedIn product lead and the co-author of Reimagine, Building Products with Generative AI, which was released recently, and you can search for it on Amazon. Let's talk more about it. Thank so you so much, David, time. for having me here today. Uh, my pressure and uh, yeah, can't wait to dive in. I'm really looking forward to our conversation. To warm up, when you contacted me last year saying you had a manuscript, I was impressed to say the least. I didn't know you were writing a book and then you came with a manuscript while I was trying to create mine and you boom, shared your wow. That was impressive. How did you get inspired to write this book? Yeah, that's a great question. And thank you so much. Uh, it's definitely a journey. I learn a lot in the process, but um, AI help a lot in the process too. So I would just say the inspiration came twofold. Uh, I think the first one was, uh, you know, since GPT released at the end of 2022, um, there was just a lot of buzz, right? Like people thinking about creating different prompts and AI just start booming of like generative AI became the hottest topic, I think, in Silicon Valley dinner tables. Um, so at the time, uh, you know, work gets pretty busy. And I was like, wow, I really wanted to carve out dedicated space to learn more about it. So I started with uh, following my curiosity, right? Like if generative AI can do so much across different modalities, like tax, images, audio file, video, what's going to co come next? And then every week you see like newsletters start recommending probably a hundred different AI tools and they're kind of similar, but different, different GPT wrappers. So I was like, oh my gosh, I'm overwhelmed. And I don't know how to ask quite like, what's the right mental model to ask? So earlier of uh, 2023, I spent quite a bit of time studying uh, and I, like I always do, I like to produce like a learning series, uh, which is a series of posts uh, or interviews with product leaders where I like to dive in to thinking about how to think about those, those things. Um, so that's how I started, just following my curiosity. But then I realized work gets really busy and I couldn't keep up with like weekly posting. So I was like, how about I still let my creation go in the background without the pressure of like weekly or daily, you know, uh, 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 content creation. So I created this uh, book drop on the background. But what really spiked um, the creation of a book was uh, really in June, I met up with uh, two other friends who were old friends that we lost touch for about five years. And one of them was um, like an investor um, and she knew of another entrepreneur who's uh, building applications using AI to write a book. Uh, mm. So basically you upload files. That was before GPT can do like, you know, the knowledge base. So it was like, oh, you can actually, you know, create your little LLM. A uh, large language model based on the files that you upload uh, off a foundational model. So that was pretty cool, right? So then I start curating all this, my different posts, all the books that I love. And I was like, I remember it was one Friday, uh, you know, at LinkedIn, which every month we have one Friday where you can dedicate, there's no meeting, you can dedicate it to what you want to work on. So then uh, after lunch, I remember I went to a hacker house, which is also a new concept in Silicon Valley. Based basically means that founders sleep together in a huge house. It's actually quite fancy. There's like swimming pools and stuff. Wow. But um, so I went there and we were playing with that tool that the entrepreneur was creating. And so I remember quite vividly that the outline that the AI generate was really amazing. But then when you read the actual text, it was kind of like dry, you know, just like any other AI application people's, but it was cool enough that it inspired me of like, what about I became a co-pilot, like a co-author with the book. And so it gives me a lot uh, with the AI, sorry. So mm -hmm. it gives me a lot of inspiration to like tweak, tweak in, like just playing with the AI. So I would say 
the inspiration came from just curiosity and then also this serendipitous moment. Um, I stay that night uh, till almost like 1 a.m. before I get home. <laughs> so it was just like so much fun, so much like tinkering happening. Um, and I'm happy to talk about the process of working with AI and, and to what extent the book was written by AI and my original versus my and my co-author's original insight. That's quite cool. So it came from curiosity. Then you felt a little bit overwhelmed by everything that was happening. And then you created the learning series and start writing the book using AI. That's impressive. One thing that comes to my mind is AI is such a broad topic. When you look at your book, what is the overview for those who want to read it? Yeah, absolutely. So I started the book more as a I like I said, following curiosity. So the book is pretty much structured by a like like a FAQ, frequently asked question. So there's three parts to the book. One is about just a general understanding of the landscape, right? Like what is generative AI? How is that different from other type of AI? How is it being used? What are the challenges and, and limitations? Um, you know, who are the winner? Who are the player? And how do we think about it? Mm -hmm. um, the second part of the book is really diving into the needy greedies and the craftsmanship of building generative AI and power product. So do you do discovery the same way? How do you validate hypothesis very quickly? How is building Gen AI product different from building other type of software products? Um, and how you think about go to market, you know, uh, measuring product market fit, what uh, traditional product management methodology can still apply um, in the context of uh, building generative AI and what are, what are unique about it. And then sort of part two ends with a debate around like building moats, uh, which means you know, today, like in the past where startup have a lot of advantage around speed and focus and traditional SaaS business model, right? A startup can move really fast, deliver a really good experience and then become a unicorn eventually, hopefully, right? But in the case of generative AI, the playbooks seem to have like the, the script flipped because big incumbents are moving really fast with a lot of resources. You know, you see Microsoft, Google, Apple, Facebook moving really fast into the space um, and trying to add like co-pilot features on top of it, right? Which is like all the hundred of apps that I told you about that were GPT wrappers only find out like over time no matter how focused and the fast at the speed, they seem to lose out to incumbents who already control the distribution of the market. Um, so I put out sort of an argument, like a blue team versus red team on can you build moats um, and can you differentiate in a sustainable way in this market? So it's sort of a work in progress thesis to invite debates and, and you know different point of view. And then part three is making it more personally relevant to all the product managers and product builders. So it talks about careers, uh, both in terms of how the product management process can be you know, reimagined, um, uh, as well as the product management career, which I know that you wanted, you will touch upon quite a bit in, in our interview today. So yeah, three parts, just a general overview of the landscape. Second is like the product craftsmanship from discovery to all the way to go to market. Um, you know, what are the different special consideration? And then I ends with like, sort of like, what does it mean to be a product manager, you know, in this new market? So. Yeah, the structure speaks to me pretty much because I like you bring some clarity to this broad term AI because a lot of people talk about it, but there's more to it. You bring clarity, then get hands on and equip people. That's what I like about the book. But my curiosity is you put a lot of energy on it. What is your objective with the book? Yeah, it's funny because um, so I always wanted to become, a, to, to publish a book. That's like my personal dream, but I never had the time, right? Like, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot of work and actually my new year's resolution for 2023 at the beginning was like, I'm going to publish a book. I don't know what I'm going to talk about. I had two topics at a time. One was uh, a career transition. Like, how do you navigate that? Because I actually uh, was a pivoter into product about five, five years ago, even though all of my career for, you know, 12 years have been in the product space, but without the title mm -hmm. uh, and in Silicon Valley, that matters, even though you're doing the work. So, so over the years, I coached like hundreds of people uh, to make the transition. So I thought I'm going to profile uh, and make this book like a pivoter 
their career pivoters, um, you know, uh, book. Uh, but then I thought about, I really like the craftsmanship of thinking about product strategy too. So then I go into the other camp of like, I'm going to create a product book. But then I know David and you and many other people are creating another like product book, right? So I was, I don't know what my differentiations are. And then AI start happening and my work gets really busy. So this just put in the shelf. And then until I met that technology and it bundles with this curiosity, I was like, you know what? I'm just going to get it you know, publish it uh, and try it out. And I want to try it out with AI. So I use AI initially to generate an outline, give me inspiration, not that great, but good enough to keep uh -huh. me going. And then, so then I would challenge the AI and say, okay, so you said this in the outline, how would you write a draft chapter? Right. And then like, you, you know, it would give me something and I was like, mm, I don't like this example, replace it with something else. Or how would you think about it differently? So I was like dancing and playing with it. And so I really enjoyed that process. So if you ask me my personal objective, I think it's a long time dream. I think it also creates like, oh, what happened now that if I have a book, can I deliver a corporate workshop? Can I speak to more people? Is it going to sell? Like, it's like a little mini experiment for me to like, envisioning a future of myself being a published author um and then what kind of question i would ask what it takes to market the book i did probably 10 percent of what i envisioned to do because work gets so busy but it's a good exercise it's like a good test scram so i do not see my first book being like this grand success and huge success and the last book but it's really opening the full step for 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 a new future and I do see AI enabled writing is going to be the future. So being the pioneer on that feels like very interesting. It speaks to my curiosity and it just feeds me. So a lot of it, I would say it's intrinsic, less of like we discussed just now, like Amazon takes 70% of the cut. So for people who are hesitant to buy the book, that's thinking that should we just try to make money with AI? That's probably wrong. I can probably make more money doing something else than spending like, couple hundred hours, you know, trying to create a book, edit it. And I don't have another hundred hours to, to market the book. So, uh, but I hope you enjoy learning about it. Also to create discussion, you know, people will come to me and say, part of the book makes sense, part of it not. Um, so yeah. It's quite interesting. There's a lesson on it because you said you're a pivoter and your book, you start with an idea about career and then about strategy and you went up to something totally different because you saw the opportunity and it's really about product management. And it's then, but, it, but it sometimes, but David, remember I told you the three parts, the yeah. overview, the product strategy and the career It's sort of actually the dots connecting, even though it was something completely different, like building Gen AI. Yes. So one of the biggest personal lessons that I learned, I think last year, over the course of last year, it, this is going to sound spiritual. So I'm going to warn people who are used to using their right brain a lot. Um, was it left brain? Like the, the scientific brain, you know, I'm like that person too. I'm a super rational person. I plan a lot. I'm a super planner. I stick to my plan. But then I realized sometimes when you loosen the grip a little bit, universe is going to come to you with something greater that you don't even know. I just want to pause for a moment there to let you wonder about it. Because sometimes when you are very confused or frustrated, it's maybe because you're not creating enough space to really hear that inner voice, that inner wisdom that's coming to you. So one of the biggest things I learned was that instead of judging myself and pushing me to like, I need to have the right answer right now in this moment, I feel like sometimes if you just create a little space and embark on a sense of curiosity, that answer will come to you. And it might be better than what you originally anticipated. So I will just give a spoiler. I would say if anyone leaves the podcast right now, this is the number one, <laughs> number one takeaway. I want everybody, um, it's a life philosophy. Obviously I can share more about practical AI steps and stuff, but this was the biggest lesson, single most important lesson. This is amazing. Wow, it is a great tip. It is about stepping back and just breathing, right? Sometimes we get so busy with everything that we don't even have time to think about it. It's so important, this part of stepping back. Thank you. If you look at the book, I want to talk about something a little bit polemic. 
That is happening right now. It's kind of, we all know, AI is advancing like crazy. It's now rapid pace and there are many tools emerging. You said about writing. I use a lot of Grammarly to write and now I started using also GPT-4 to research, not creating full blown articles, that, but it gives a lot of direction. It's way faster going to do, but there's one thing about PMs. And I see some questions. Is it a danger or an empowerment? Some people say, will this thing make my job obsolete? Or actually, what is going to happen? So I'm very curious to have your take on that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I put a little bit of perspective in the book as well. I know Marty Kagan recently did a lot of, um, you know, debates, uh, right, uh, with his new book coming out as well. Um, and with the change from Airbnb and a lot of that stuff, I would, I, I probably will tackle it in one. I think my take is that, um, so the International Monetary Fund, IMF, predicted that 60% of jobs in advanced economies and knowledge worker might be impacted by AI for good and bad, right? So I think instead of feeling like, you know, you're the victim of that, like the job security is on the line. I really encourage people to adopt a more um, co-pilot mindset. In the book, I break it down into three different mindsets. But I would just say the first thing to answer your question is that certain top parts of PM job will be rendered not needed or obsolete because of AI. Like the traditional, in what Marty Kagan's turn, like the feature, uh, feature factory PMs, if you're working on feature uh, you know, without a clear goal, clear OKR, um, if you're working mostly managing JIRA tickets, agile methodology, the set news is unfortunately, those work my go away with AI. So what that means is that you should aim to reskill yourself. Um, but I don't want you to feel like this is like a, a loose sense of job security because it is. But if if you're thinking about it that way as a victim, then you're losing out to the game. I'm really, really passionate about how this is helping you to create a new future. So you should reframe and think about, okay, it's time to upgrade my skill set. And with the help of AI, I can upgrade my skill set faster than anyone else, right? So in the book, I put out three mental mindset. I said, envision AI as an enabler because you know, in the past, you might have to spend a lot of time. I mean, how many times you spend on updating status report, different format of the same update on different, like it's an executive update, it's a team update, it's a cross-function update. Like you have to write all of that, right? Sometimes that takes like one Monday. Like that's usually my Monday, right? Like a lot of mundane, repetitive. AI can help you with that, right? So AI is an enabler. It can automate certain workflow. And then the second mindset is consider AI as your co-pilot or like this coach and player mentality. But make sure you are the coach, you are not the player. And I really like that mentality, you know why, David? Because how many coaches, like look at all the American football, tennis, right? How many coaches, uh, you know, like uh, uh, Venice and Serena Williams, best tennis player, women be best tennis player, their father was their coach. Uh -huh. You think he will be them in tennis? No, but he enable, you know, some of the best tennis player out there. It's the same as, you know, when human working with AI, I think the, men, the, the, the framing that you should have in your mind isn't that I'm going to be better than AI. It means yeah. like you are better in the player, right? The actual expertise. I think the idea is how do I guide AI so that it works for me or works to solve this problem in the best way, in the most efficient way, in the most productive way. That way you are reframing it from, from you are the victim. You're reframing it from competing with something that's super nat natural. You're not going to win in that, right? But you are still at the driver's seat. So there's a sense of, you know, coexisting, this, this great relationship and the acknowledgement with a sense of humbleness. And I'm not, I'm not going to be AI, but I can still be in the driver's seat giving guidance so I would say the number one skill to learn, I know later on you will ask that, is actually prompt engineering. But the eng I like to drop the engineering part because I don't code. So I don't actually use Python to do like all this prompt engineering, but I use human language. But that's a whole skill there to like, how do you write a really good prompt? A lot of people come to me and say, AI hey, give generic shit. Like they don't enjoy like generic responses. Well, 
my first question is going to ask like, how, what did you put in your prompt? If you give me a prompt, I can guarantee you that I can 10 X the quality of the output. If you just write better. So this co co-pilot, this dancing tangle, I think it's really, really important. And the last thing I would say, the last mindset is embrace AI as an amplifier. So we can touch upon some of that, but like, for example, if I want to make a mini movie, like an animated film of my life or something in the past, I would never thought about it because what I would have to do, well, I would have to look up some courses, maybe on LinkedIn learning, maybe on YouTube, maybe Skillshare and spend like what, 10 hours just watching the video. And if I like diligent enough, I would spend 40 hours practicing what's taught in that video and not being very good about it. Right. Like, and that's, so you ended up putting maybe over a hundred hours trying to craft that little film and like, and still look a little like um, amateur quality, right? But today with AI, there are some applications out there. You can just write a couple prompts and Sora just came out an open AI, which I think a lot of us are getting really excited to try it. It's going to go crazy, right? It's a couple prompt that gets you almost professionally looking quality it might be even better than what you would do with a hundred hours, let alone like, are you going to actually invest a hundred hours in doing it? So AI is a great amplifier in both how, you know, you might be able to stand up a prototype without, without code. For example, you can use text to code. You will improve your inch, you know, your, your ability to work with your engineers. There's text to design prompts. So you might get a prototype out without you having to learn how to use balsamic or having a design taste all of that is baked in, right? Like what's well, the best design principles. Um, so imagine how exciting that future would be compared to managing Jira tickets and safe wow. principles. And, <laughs> and I like what yeah. you say. It is about um, the future, looking at as a victim, but what can I do about it? Enabler, coach, and amplifier. I have been doing my best to learn about the prompts, as you mentioned. Here's an example I did recently. I had a few thousand people who want to learn more about my book and they said what they wanted to learn. How would I consolidate all of this information? They wrote many things there. I can consolidate, but it will take a lot of time. But if I use the right prompt, I can get insights from there so I can talk to the audience directly. These are kind of things that AI can do better than I would. But it's about amplifying, enabling, but there's a catch. You need to make a contextual prompt because if you just say like, look at this and give me the insights, then for sure you're going to get something generic. But if you ask to behave as a product lead and search for specific things there, then you get way better answers. This is about like take control. You're not out of control. You don't need to feel like that. I really like what you said. Thank you. Now, when it comes to the product manager role, you touched base already about Airbnb. So we are saying about AI, some things may become obsolete. I agree. The feature factory, the PM taking care of Jira and so on. And I say maybe some things that come for good, but there are some other companies that are taking the product manager role to another extreme of Airbnb saying, we don't have PMs anymore. I see here in Europe, they say we start with a product engineer and no PM. But what do you think is the future of this role? Yeah, that's a great question. I think as someone who's coming from a um, sort of a different background, so a little bit about myself, just time travel back, maybe I've been at LinkedIn for about six and a half years, a little less than that. But before then, a lot of my roles was working as a digital strategy consultant or wh whatever you call it. I, I service over 12 different industries uh, and different clients, small, big, bigger client, nonprofit, government, uh, Fortune 100 customers, and working on different capacity. Um, so what I realized was that people are too fixated on the title, uh, you know, like product manager or something like that, product owner, and what's the difference between the two and blah. I think I will focus more on the job function and the role and the, the, the impact the role is creating or more focus on the challenge and the problem space. So in the last 12 months in my role at LinkedIn, I've actually involved a lot of my responsibility into more like a general manager 
versus mm -hmm. product manager. So what that means is that I work with functions across sales, marketing, customer success. I look at corp corporate de development, meaning like, do we buy or bill, you know, a specific capability or products, right? I work obviously in the traditional sense with engineering design and data science, um, but I also look at a lot of different part of marketing. Um, so I think at the end of the day, I would say pro, pro, uh, product manager is going to maybe change to something like a problem manager, mm -hmm. for like a better way to describe it. But you then own a problem space. Like what is your problem space? For example, for me, it was identifying the next uh, wave of growth for LinkedIn, right? Like that's a big problem space. So whatever it takes to get there is what your role will be. So that's much harder to be replaced by AI versus I am just responsible for the product part. I don't look at growth. I don't know if retention is some other PM's role, maybe onboarding is some other team. Sure, maybe organizationally that is, but as the problem space manager or problem owner, you should really think through what that would mean for your user, for your target, for your scope. So that's how I think I think about career, like you are being the owner of the problem, no matter what it takes, ownership mentality, right? Like how to tackle this problem. And you are the connective tissue, meaning like if anything felt apart, it's kind of up to you to have to like step it up and fix it and piece it together. Um, so that's how I would think about how the PM role will evolve and less fixated on the title itself. That's a terrific answer. I haven't thought from this perspective. Because so many times I see the discussion, what is a PM? What is a PO? I say, whatever. Well, let's talk about the PZ, PL. It doesn't really matter. It's about the responsibilities you have. And I like this idea of maybe let's move more to problem because generally this is something that gets forgotten or it's very easy to get hooked with the solution and forget the problem you're even trying to solve and why that matters. And solutions are something that AI will probably do better than we can do. Yeah. Yeah. Now it comes a question. A lot of people are wondering, oh, it's a lot to learn. So how do you develop AI expertise? Yeah, there's a lot of resources out there. A lot of free courses all around. Some of them are longer, some of them are shorter. I think the highest leverage activity that one can do and the easiest to do is like we said, like learn how to write a really good prompt. And it doesn't actually takes a lot of effort, but it takes a mindset shift. So there's a couple key component you need to incorporate in a prompt, right? Like you said, like first is like providing the context, the role, defining the role, like who is this AI? So instead of just saying, I like summarize this insight for me, you should probably tell him, hey, uh, you are a, a product, you know, uh, um, a, a, an excellent product manager who's very skilled at looking at, uh, uh, you know, user insight, dugging into the non obvious insight, and you uh, have a passion in a particular problem statement or pro problem industry. So that's setting the context by giving it a role, AI a role. And then you can say, okay, so here is, um, you know, what I need you to do, like giving instruction, very specific instruction. And then the third aspect could be like, giving them expectations and like, here's what you expect. And there, if it, it would be great if you have an example, like, hey, here's a potential example output, potential format, I like you to, you know, respond. Um, and then if there's like certain exceptions, like, hey, don't do this, don't do that. Like I like to use, like use only simple English. Don't go fancy. Cause sometimes the AI like to write uh -huh. like really grand big words and you're like, no bullshit, right? Like, you know, just, focus on the simple expi explicit um, and then that's like what format or what structure you want the output to be going in as part of that instru instruction. So if you can provide all of this context, it helps a lot, right? To produce uh, the best uh, AI, AI result. So it just know that and then start experimenting, try different things. Don't get give up when like one thing didn't work. Then you're going to sit back and say, what else can I do? I just uploaded this file and asked it to summarize it for me. It didn't work. How about I, I copy and paste section of that file? And then so instead of tackling the entire file, I tackle part of the file. Or, or like 
different variety. Treat it as like an experimentation engine and you really iterate from it. So I think this new wave of AI is really flavor people who have a learning persona that's much more hands-on, iterative, experiment-driven, less of like sit there, you know, read a book or listen to a lecture. You got to really just open your browser and try or download app, check out different apps to try. Um yeah, it's it's time for the makers and doers. It's time to get hands on. I like the approach. Just try it out. There's so many things. I tried, for example, I'm in Germany and I speak a bit of German. My wife is trying to prove her German. And I said, you know, you can learn that with chat GPT. I told her. So I took my phone and I set the context with chat GPT. I said, now I want you to behave as a German teacher who is able to teach someone who is Russian native, help her improve her German. And then they start talking and she was shocked. She said, seriously, it can do like that? I said, yes, it can. It is about trying. Then you can see how powerful this become. But I like what you are saying about learning how to create the prompt and the context, the expectations, what you don't want to see. It has a lot to do with leadership. Yeah, yeah. Giving example, right? Setting example. I like that, how you treat the prompt uh, instruction to basically leadership quality traits of like, you know, if you're a manager, you're going to tell your direct reports, like what your expectations are, why you're doing this, setting the context, right? What a good, what does good look like? What you should not do <laughs> right and then what 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 you want the output to be yeah it's a very transferable that's so it reminded me of um, an exercise i like doing with anyone who start working with me i call it expectations expected i say what i expect from the person and what i don't and i ask the person to share the same so with ai it's in the same direction i expect ai to do that and i expect you not to do this it's quite interesting now we are at text practice, but going a little bit more into details. You gave some examples, but I want to go more into that. Could you share more examples of how AI is shaping the products? Yeah, so I like to tackle it from two perspectives. I think one is um, from the product development side, what are some new developments that could be benefit from AI very quickly, but I really wanted to go the second route, which is talking about a framework or a mental model. It's all about how you think with AI, right? They, they mm -hmm. can eventually do the work. So it's very important in the new era to think about like how to think right, think correctly, like what to have the right mental model. Um, so I would talk about what are some use cases that are good for AI? What are not, right? How do you make that call? Um, so I think from a product development standpoint, some of the biggest, you know, areas that I'm seeing people using a lot of AIs are, you know, um, communication, like, you know, basically text, uh, prompt, a prompt to text to write like certain draft a PRD, like creating a draft, right, of some form, an email or a status update. Mm -hmm. The second area is like text to code, a little less for PM, but it's it's an enabler if you like to create stuff. The third aspect is like, you know, creating prototype, like I mentioned, like a quick like um, sketch of a product. I also see a lot of tools coming up. Like I, I knew probably at least 10 came to me and say they are aggregating insights from different sources. And then they're trying to synthesize what's the critical user insight without, you know, PMs having to dug in. I think there's both pros and cons to some of that. Uh, but those are popular sort of applications within the product development space. I like to take a step back and really think about what's the mental model that we should think mm -hmm. about what use cases are good for, you know, using AI. I think there's a couple factors to consider. The first is, you know, like, um, what is the um, requirements for, for like fluency in the, in AI? Like, can AI help you create a first draft? If, if that's something that you know AI can easily do, that's worth a try. The second thing is thinking about the stake or the risk of AI generated output. This is where I really like just have AI create a preliminary draft or a proposal, but then you can have human in the loop to kind of validate 
mm-hmm. where did you generate this from um, before they make that final decision or they can tweak you know, it's easier to jumpstart as writers, you and I, content creators. So it's always easier to start not with a blank sheet of paper, right? With something that you can critique, something you can build upon. So those are really good use cases for AI. But from a commercial application standpoint, like how do you accrue value? How do you make money? I think there are additional questions you can think about. One is the use cases that you use for AI. How frequently does it happen? Mm-hmm. So like, for, for example, like for LinkedIn, it would be the job search scenario. If you're a premium user in the US, um, you know, you look for a job, we will have prompts to tell you, well, am I a good fit for this role? Uh, how do I customize my profile or my resume to be better fitted for this role? I want to learn more about the company and this role. So all of those can have like fairly frequent usage, right? So then you create enough value. And then the second thing is thinking about how is the AI enable experience can be tied to a dollar amount, if any, or some sort of process gain? Because you might need to otherwise do a lot of manual work to research, to find. So I see a lot of companies, they're vertically specialized, uh, meaning, for example, yesterday I was looking at a company, actually a lot in their legal um, space, trying to create a draft, you know, like um, cases based on previous case file because there are hundreds and thousands of them that could actually you know creating a first draft of a five thousand dollar document that's huge yeah. right another application that i look at what look at yesterday was that salespeople, you know when you go to enterprise sales a lot of them need a pitch based on case studies of hey someone used my application and make this much money or save this much cost but developing and profiling those case studies and personalize it to the particular company you're trying to sell to takes a lot of work, right? And AI can do this pretty well. And it's a very niche use case, right? So how much it jumpstart, but human are still in the loop validating, you know, the content. So then it's not the stake can be managed. It's not that much of risk. Mm -hmm. So those use cases are really good for AI to like jumpstart, frequent usage, have a direct tie to the value that you can create and solving a real problem, both from the mon- monetary standpoint or pro- process efficiency standpoint, so that you can really quantify the value. And then last but not least, from a very uh, technical standpoint is like, do you have data sets that you can draw from, right? To really produce the output you want. Um, how feasible is it? How good are those data set? Those are gonna be like the sort of keeping you grounded and reality factor right? Of like, do you have what it takes? Um, It's kind of like, I love cooking. So I'm a home chef. It's kind of like, if you want to make a a delicious meal, do you have the the right ingredient in place? Yeah. Right. To to do it. So that's that last part um, is sort of the foundation. Do you have the right ingredients? That's a good question. Also, what you're saying, not everyone is fast or comfortable with creation. Not everyone likes creating, and it can be quite painful for some people. But what I learned after I started creating content, almost everyone is very good at criticizing. If you show something, people are good at looking, and then they can share their opinions. They can make it better, and they criticize it. Not in a bad way, but people can criticize what they see, so AI can help them see something and make it better. That's a great observation, yes. In the maritime industry which is very different. The reason I accept it is because it has a lot of room to innovate. It has a lot of room to bring technology as an advantage because it's very advanced in terms of hardware, not software. I use a lot of AI to level up my knowledge. Not that I take everything as true, but then I can double check. The point is it boosts learning. Now, application of AI, what is your favorite and why? I don't have a creative answer for this one. I can give you a few, but my so far, my most favorite is still GPT-4. Mm-hmm. I use it a lot for everything um, to help me criticize my thinking. I use it as a career coach, believe it or not, or therapist sometimes. I was like, I'm being bugged down. I feel overwhelmed. I'm doubting my self-worth, like help me. Um, so I do like it. Um, and uh, perplexity AI is also an interesting one who like transform search. So basically I encourage folks to try it out once or twice, like instead of, you know, how, like 
when you search, hey, what car to buy, for example, in the book, if I use that example, Google will probably give you a page of links that you still have to click into it, read those blog articles, figure out what it takes. They start to release some feature, Google, to summarize the search result as well. Things are moving fast, so it's not always that the moats isn't always there, but perplexity AI would understand, hey, who you are, what your aspiration are for purchasing your first car, for example, and then basically summarize, here are the four models you might want to consider, check it out. Here's the pros and cons of why you should consider each. Hey, that saved me a ton of time than clicking yeah. on the five first page Google result to figure out what to buy next, right? Um, I still need to play around with image generation more. My co-author was like a lot better than me in that, but I enjoy um, you know, using mid journey and also the Dell E com that comes with GPT four to kind of tweak on different, different images. Um, not my strong suits yet. I can feel you. I'm a big fan of chat GPT as well. I have been trying to use more doll E for my posts and so on, but I haven't been that successful to say. I try, but yeah, I Dal E still has like the graphic, just like not quite at the level of sophistication as mid journey. I think the new, some of the nuances that doesn't show there, um, but you know, never hurt to try. And it's, yeah. it's free with GPT four versus, you know, mid journey, you have to pay for an extra subscription. So yeah. that's an added benefit. We touch base a little bit on learning, but when you think of what you said about just get hands on, on try prompt and so on. Would you have another recommendation for those who want to start with AI? Well, read my book. <laughs> it's a quick summary of AI. I think that could be one. Um, there's a lot of free courses, you know, online. LinkedIn Learning released about a hundred of those. And then YouTube has a lot. I think to start, I, I would reflect back on what is one skill that you really want to learn or one problem you feel like you really wanted to um, tackle and then just follow your curiosity there. So what I mean is like wear a little founder hat. Let's say I'm really passionate about um, what's a good problem, uh, like, you know, a neighborhood, uh, you, you know, not talking to each other or something. Can you create an AI, can you use AI to generate some form to spark conversation among your neighbors? What would it take? Or if you want to make money, like on YouTube, there's a lot of money, passive income on like AI arts, sell it on Etsy. Um, what does that process look like? How can I create a website in 20 minutes using AI? So like use case specific projects can get you really going, get your creative juice going. And that's how you know how to search. And then, you know, then you, then the sky is the limit from there. Yeah, the sky is the limit. And I agree with you for those trying to understand what it is all about, getting a bit of creativity, reading your book would help a lot. I remember how you started with Alan Turing and so on different prompts and can give a lot of orientation on this part about what you said, giving the context. What do you want to get? What kind of answer? If you don't want a generic answer, remember, put there, explain this to a five-year-old, explain this to ta -na -na -ta -na -na. So this can be quite helpful to get the big picture and then use the creativity and just get hands on like it. Yeah, I like, I think the point is AI right now is getting quite powerful. Um, so it's better that you don't learn it in a vacuum, meaning you just read or just watch, but make it to solve a problem that you care about right now, whether it's you're suffering from it or you feel very passionate about like, if money is not a problem, I want to solve this problem. Like try to think about how would you put on your founder head and use AI to solve the problem? Because then you get much more motivation to learn because it's so much more relevant to you. And it's so much more fun to learn a kid that way. And then once you learn that, a lot of that skills are going to transferable, transfer to other problems that you're trying to solve. Then the next time you have a, like a different problem, you'll be like, oh yeah, last time I wrote this prompt and it has that six components that I just lay out for you earlier in the podcast, you're going to know how to write a prompt, right? So yeah. those are the skills that, um, you, you know, I think a lot of us should, should learn. It's indeed getting very powerful. 
I was trying some other things there. For example, my wife was searching for some partners for her business in Munich. And I described her business and I said, that's the situation. I want you to find partners she can contact. And then GPT-4 found partners and said why she should contact. And I said, now give me the pitch so I get based on what you want to achieve. And honestly, it was quite solid. It was impressive. It was quite helpful because if I would do all of that on my own, I would need to go to Google and do all of that on my own and so on. Not so easy, quite time consuming. But with GPT-4, it took just a couple of seconds to get something we could progress. What's something that's often overlooked at AI? Yeah, that's a good one. I think first, just the importance of prompt engineering. So obvious, not a lot of people know about it. What's the second thing? Um, I think, yes. Yeah, so, so a lot of people think about, not thinking about the, I, I think people are too much like, either AI is going to be so scary, replace us all, mm -hmm. or... AI is so great. I use it for everything. And then people then start to think about what happened to our human judgment. And so people tend to have this either all thinking, whereas I think it's more powerful if you are somewhere in the, like not the either all, but like really being in the middle and really think about first principle thinking, right? Like that's where AI still don't have because AI generate input based on what they already know, but they don't know what they don't know. So humans are better at figuring out, and you can use AI to challenge your thinking. So one thing I like to do is that a lot of people, 90% of us probably just use AI to like, do this for me. How about you also do another use case, which is you write up something or maybe AI help you generate something. And then now you're like, critique this from this other perspective. So then you basically force yourself to think about it from a lot of different non-obvious angle, right? Um, for example, how would an environmentalist react to this idea? How would a chef react to this idea? How would a someone in the middle of America doesn't have a lot of good, you know, high level education would react to my product idea? So you get like more diverse thoughts. And I think that's, that's the way to go. Great insight. I've benefited from it already. I was testing the cover of my book and different designs, different methods. And I use a question, how would a product manager within two years of experience react to that? Then I use a product lead, an agile code. And then I added info about location, like from USA, from India, and so on. I got a lot of insight and I knew what I had to shape it. But when I look at it alone, I couldn't see that perspective. But GPT helped me broaden it. It was so amazing. Thank you. Now we're coming to the end, but I still want to have something as we wrap it up. What would you like our audience to take away from your book and this discussion? Yeah, so um, I would say the biggest takeaway I want folks to get, obviously we cover a lot of ground. Earlier, we talked about how you should listen, create space to listen to your inner voice, uh, see what universe have to show you. Uh, a little bit spiritual. That's still my biggest learning uh, from a life philosophy standpoint. But more practically, if you're thinking about AI, my biggest takeaway, I think one is just, you have to embrace this notion of being a permanent beta, meaning like you're never set. So you always keep evolving and changing, right? Like you're a beta product. So you always testing what's my personal product market fit, right? If you are the product uh, and never stop learning. Prompt engineering might be your number one biggest leverage. So learn that today. And it's not that hard. Like I, we basically told you about the six, five or six components of crafting a good prompt. Go try it. Try it to solve your, right now, what's your biggest problem? Try to have a conversation with AI with that prompt and see where that guides you. I mm -hmm. would say that's the biggest takeaway. That's biggest homework that I would assign everybody to do. And obviously the secondary homework might be to buy my book um, and read it and let me know how you think. Um, yeah, I would love to hear from everybody. Thank you so much, David, for the opportunity today. I really value that. Wow, that's so insightful. Thanks so much. You're never set, keep involving. 
I love it. So, Shibi, it has been an absolute pleasure to have you here. Thanks a lot for sharing all of these insights with your genuine experience. And for everyone watching, don't forget to grab her book if you want to learn AI. I think that's where you should start. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks again. Don't for, feel free to follow me on LinkedIn and send me a message if you want to have follow-up question or have a perspective. Um, I welcome, uh, you know, chats from everybody. Thanks a lot for all of you watching this. Let's rock the product world together.